the session on the Quality Matters White Papers on academic rigor. I appreciate those of you who took a little bit of time to respond to the uh, Poll Everywhere post. This is one of the reasons that I hide my discussion forums until everybody posts because I see the word challenging a lot. That's a good word to use. And we see substantive feedback, critical thinking, and assessment, a lot of assessment terminology. I am Andrea Schwegler, and I had a unique opportunity to write a series of white papers for Quality Matters. And if you've noticed in some of the sessions you've attended, they're taking a step into quality assurance in multiple spaces, not just maybe online, but we're looking at more delivery standards and things like that. So I wanna welcome you to the session. Those of you who could join me in Texas, and those of you who are online, I appreciate you visiting. The learning outcomes from the session, we're going to do a little bit to distinguish some of the constructs that are typically confounded with rigor. We're going to give multiple types of evidence that we can cite to document what academic rigor is. And then I'm going to provide examples from my institution that maybe will trigger some ideas for how you can apply the information in the white papers at your institution. For the agenda, I'm not going to read the white papers to you. Sorry, <laughs> you can do that. But what I'll do is briefly summarize where we are in the academic rigor landscape. I'll provide the definition of academic rigor that we're using for this discussion. And then, like I said, I'll give you some examples from my institution and challenge you to take this out and make it better. When we look at where we are in academic rigor, this is where I landed when I started doing the research on this project. Academic rigor has a negative connotation. It's rigid and flexible. It's associated with things in academia that are removed from the real world. It's widely used, but if you ask someone to define it, it's challenging. There's no consensus. When there are definitions that are published, there's not, it's hard to find a common pattern. And sometimes it's assumed to exist in higher education, even though there's no evidence to demonstrate it. The concern with not having a solid definition or evidence to support it is that we, we may engage in a death spiral, a negative spiral, when it comes to student learning. It could threaten it. There is evidence in the literature that students will try to re renegotiate standards to try to get them lower, especially if they're not prepared and if there are a few resources to help the students. There's plenty of examples of grade inflation. And then there's a focus on retention but there are concerns that if we move students on to graduation, are they actually learning additional information? What I noticed as I was looking at the definitions of academic uh, rigor in the literature, there's confounding teacher responsibilities and student responsibilities, and I'll show you an example of that. And it may be confounding curriculum with course delivery. Curriculum may be set collaboratively by program faculty. It may be affected by program accreditation standards, but that's separate from what the teaching decisions we are that we make in the classroom. And if we pull in information from cognitive psychology, we realize that humans are notoriously bad at understanding how we learn the best. So if we just rely on what feels easy or what feels like we're learning, we're gonna miss the mark. So we need to look at some empirical research and pull in how we can best facilitate teaching and learning. So as I laid out a definition of academic rigor, it was definitely grounded in what is currently in the research literature in teaching and learning and in cognitive psychology, what we know from human learning from that perspective. And I attempted to unconfound teacher and student responsibilities, the whole you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink, unconfound, curriculum and course delivery, and then try to get away from the subjective biased arguments that we have about this is rigorous and this isn't. Maybe we can ground it in something that's a little bit more objective and easier to talk about. The goals are to be observable and measurable, it sounds familiar, so that we can subject that to continuous improvement and it prioritizes student learning. This is the location of academic rigor. This is in the second white paper. I'll go through it very quickly here because you can read the paper and get more details if, if you need those. But we'll start over here with the real world. There's a real world out there where our learners exist, their jobs and their families and so on. From this real world, we build our programs to teach students so that they can go interact effectively in that real world context. 
And that's where the curriculum is. And so we have multiple players figuring out what the curriculum is from business partners to program faculty. So we try to make that nest to the real world. We take that curriculum and we put it in our learning context. And I chose that word so we don't evoke brick and mortar images of classrooms because this is a demonstration of how we extend far beyond that now. So the learning context is that interface of teachers and learners. That's where academic rigor is located. It's located in what students are able to do in that space and the decisions faculty make in that space. We can't forget that we also have many times institutional supports for learning. So our tutoring centers, our writing centers, we can pull those in to better align and support the efforts our students are doing in the classroom. Then finally, we get to student learning. I said this is a priority, right? Student learning is impacted by a whole host of variables and the teacher can't be directly responsible for all of them. Some of them are based on student motivation, whether your mom gets sick that semester, there's a lot of things that happen to affect student learning. Now, we would hope there's a causal path between what we do in the learning context that does play out in student learning, and we can assess that. So the hands on the clock there, that's taking those learning artifacts and going back to improve the program curriculum. Are we missing anything? Go back to improve the classroom learning context. What can we do better? And go back to maybe even loop in those student support services so how can we, they help us better promote this student learning? And ideally, students will take what they've learned, go out into the real world, and be effective citizens and effective employers and professionals in their areas. Putting academic rigor in this context led to a definition of academic rigor based on current research that is giving a nod to both what the teacher does and what the students do. For the teacher side of it, we have intentionally crafted and sequenced learning activities and interactions that are supported by research. Then for the student side, students have the opportunity to create and demonstrate their own understanding, but then more than that, supported with evidence. Taking these ideas, where the rigor is located and the definition of rigor and applying them to the institution, it can provide a pathway to see maybe there are some things that we need to revise. A lot of times, some of our institutional processes are based on trends that were started 100 years ago. Well, we have a little bit more data now than we did 100 years ago, so maybe those things need to be revised. So I'll give you a few examples. This is a screenshot with the number four beside it there. That's a screenshot from our SAP for tenure and promotion. And it specifically says, I want a statement on teaching or your teaching philosophy. Well, teaching philosophies, and I've read several of these. I've served on promotion and tenure committees. I've served on hiring committees. And they're nice. They're idiosyncratic. They're personal. And they're sweet but are they diagnostic of how you're gonna perform in that classroom on students that you've never met? How are you gonna do in the future? So instead of writing a philosophy, because this area is my, my thing, I created in my personal packet a scholarly narrative of what I thought effective teaching was and the resources and research that I deploy in the classroom. It worked, I got tenure. And I, I put a reference list up here not because you need to copy down the references and if you're not even supposed to read that, but the idea is instead of philosophies, can we ask a little bit more and maybe have scholarly research supported documents? Because if you're looking at projecting that into the future, I think that would be a lot more helpful for your search committees and your promotion and tenure committees than things you can't argue with. I can't tell you your background is not good enough, but I can look at the research support. That's a little bit more helpful. A second example, and this is really getting at the heart of the matter. I had a discussion with an administrator about a hypothetical class. And I say hypothetical because you know they're really out there. This is a graduate level course that had nothing but a sequence of multiple choice exams. And in looking at this, the conversation was, I know there's not enough rigor there, but how do I start this conversation? How do I have this conversation with the faculty member? If you start it with, this course is not rigorous enough, well, then you're, well, what does that mean? Yes, it is. And I have academic freedom. I can do what I want. And then you're at a gridlock. 
There, there's nothing helpful that can come out of that starting that conversation. But if we can take rigor and look at it from a research-based perspective, and we can ask a different conversation. So what kind of research supports this design? Well, that's a different conversation. Now you're in the literature, not into being defensive. And there is research to support that. We know about the testing effect. If you test people multiple times, they're more likely to remember the information than if you just have them restudy it. So there's something there. But is that enough? What other evidence can you leverage to support that? And then, if we take that definition of rigor, what kind of evidence are students using to support the fact that they know this? Well, here's the evidence. Because I clicked A, is that really strong enough evidence to be convincing that you know what that content is because you clicked A? You could have guessed and clicked A. So when we start a conversation that way, we're asking very different questions and we're making very different conversations. Let's contrast that with a different example. And I know this is how to not make a slide. It's busy, I apologize. <laughs> Here's another hypothetical class. And I repeated the definition of rigor for you there to show you how it aligns. In this class, we have module quizzes, also multiple choice, recurring through the semester, capitalizing on that testing effect, okay? But that's not it. There's more research evidence we can bring to bear here. We have synthesis essays. So at midterm, and the end of the semester, students have an opportunity to revisit the information and bring it together in a synthesis format. We have research evidence to support that. It's called interleaving. And then if we look at the community service proposal there, there's a lot of assignments that are part of that, where students give ideas, get feedback, write the first section of the paper, get feedback, second section of the paper, get feedback, turn it in at the end. We can bring task feedback research to support that plan in the form of feedback intervention theory. If you look at the research article analysis, we don't just give them one, we give them five because this is a key skill for this particular program. And so we have space practiced. So they get to do it across the semester and practice the skills that they're gonna need later in their coursework. And then when students give a presentation on their final project, they're not presenting to me as a teacher they're presenting to that real world agency that this community service project is supposed to help. So that way they can take the information from the class directly into that real world context to facilitate that transfer. So this is an example of how the activities are sequenced across the semester. They're progressively more complex and there's research evidence that you can bring in and students are providing evidence that they know what they're doing because they're creating a persuasive appeal. So when we have that conversation, it lays out academic rigor to look something like this. It's a continuum. So that maybe we have less research support, and then maybe we have more research support. And this allows for a conversation, where do we need to be? As a program, as an individual, as a college, as a university, where do we need to be on this rigor continuum? How much evidence is enough? How much is relevant? What is relevant to our discipline? And what kind of expectations do we have for student learning? That creates a different context for a conversation. This is a true story. It's not hypothetical at all. This is from my observation of teaching back in the spring. When we look at faculty teaching, we need to give faculty members feedback to help them more effectively promote student learning. And in this case, I took a screenshot of one of my course syllabi because when it comes to distinguishing teacher and student responsibility, our registrar's office makes that very clear. When we talk about the drop policy, professors cannot drop students. This is always the responsibility of the student. Pretty clear. That's confused though on our observation form of teaching. Now granted, if you look at the second item, students are attentive and on task in class learning activities. You can see that was written for a face-to-face -face class. Because if I can look at you and tell you're paying attention, I would have to be able to see you. Sorry folks online, I can't see you. I don't know if you're paying attention or not. So in an online class, that, that's not really working well. But I have a department chair who is doing my evaluation, being creative, trying to make this work. And so, rightly so, he looked at the uh, submissions on the grade center. Well, four students weren't turning in assignments. The others were. So my evaluation was an average. Fair enough, but there's more to the story and this item is not really giving me information that's diagnostic for teaching. Because I had to email these students as we do at the beginning of the semester 
hey, class started Monday, you okay? And then, hey, you're falling behind, what can I do to help you get caught up? And then, hey, you're too far gone, you need to drop the class. Three of the four students responded and said, I know, I bet off more than I can chew this semester, I can't drop the class because I cannot pay back my financial aid. And we have head nods, yes. That's a totally different presentation and conversation, yes. At that moment, I was so thankful for the registrar because of the negative financial implications that it would have on that family if I had to drop them. So, it shows up in a faculty evaluation though. Is there anything I can do to better engage students because of that? No, they're already done, they can't, they're stuck. But we can maybe create a better instrument so that we can have better feedback for faculty that they can control. So we put that in the teacher responsibility realm and disassociate that from what students are responsible for. And this is one of my favorite examples. Student evaluation of teaching. This is a real item that came off of one of my evaluations last semester. This course was rigorous. And of the five students who took the time to fill out the survey, I got 100%. I'm rigorous, so why am I here presenting? I'm done, right? Well, the problem with these kind of direct questions is, do students really know what they're responding to? I mean, we have a hard time defining rigor, right? How do students define rigor? Well, it's in the research literature. We have a study that said that students define rigor based on a heavy workload and strict grading. But is that really what I'm after? Is that really diagnostic of what they're learning? Instead, if we look at asking different questions of students, we can do more with the feedback we get from them instead of asking questions like this. Now, these student evaluations of teaching serve two roles at our institution. One is evaluating teaching effectiveness. So it's part of our promotion and tenure process and those get factored in. But a meta-analysis came out in 2017 that reanalyzed prior studies and accounted for small study effect sizes. Whenever the size of the sample was taken into account, the relationship between student evaluation of teaching and student learning became nil. There's no relationship there. The reason we thought there was is because small studies have huge effect sizes and that's how they get published. But all the ones who didn't have that are in a file drawer somewhere, right? So we had to buy a sample to start with. When you would count for that, it disappears. So is teaching effectiveness really actually measured by ratings that are not related to student learning? And we use these indirect measures for program assessment. I took a screenshot of a rubric that, uh, as a program coordinator, my assessment plan is measured against. And it says you have to have these indirect measures. Now in the bottom, in small font, it does acknowledge this information is less clear and less convincing. Yeah, but I include it so I get these points for my rubric. But as far as using it to make real decisions about what's happening in the classroom, it's not very helpful. Because we know from research, and this is part of the biases and reporting on our own actions, Students are not really good at knowing how much they know. The Dunning-Kruger effect is fantastic because if you look at people in the lowest 20% of performance on a given task, they will think they're doing just fine because if you lack the ability to perform the task, you lack the ability to evaluate your own level of performance on that task. And so what, are, what kind of data are we getting from this? So a solution, or a step forward, can't say it's a solution, um, might be asking better questions of our students. Their voices are very valuable. The feedback they provide can be extremely useful. So let's think more clearly about what we're asking them to report on. Do, do they really know what rigor is? Or maybe they can report on certain behaviors that they are eyewitness to in the classroom, such as the instructor provided opportunities for me to create my own understanding instead of just telling me what to know. They can report on that one. And did I have to use course resources to justify my arguments and based on what I was using? Now, those are just a small sample of examples that we could take, rigor situated in the learning context, distinguishing teacher and student behaviors. What kind of processes, and you may have to look because it's hard to see, what kind of processes at your institution might need to be clarified to better support student learning if it really is based on creating a learning context and having students create their own understanding. Now, it may be hard to see 
because we're really bad at recognizing the status quo and problems with it. We accept it, it's smooth, and we keep going through. But whenever we have new ideas, research-based evidence, then it's like maybe some of this needs to be rethought. So teaching evaluations are problems at other places too. Oh yeah, reward systems. How do we reward faculty for going beyond just repeated multiple choice exams, which are self scored by the LMS and into grading and giving feedback and revising their courses? Teaching observations. So looking at the course development process itself. Yes, conversations about rigor in our courses. It's very easy to see we need to have these conversations with people who supervise us and our program faculty. We need to have these conversations with students too, because this may be a huge paradigm shift for them. If they're expecting just to listen passively to lecture and fill in some multiple choice questions, they may not like all the extra work. And given the human biases we know about learning, they're gonna say it's not helpful, it's too hard. Get help with providing feedback, yes. We can better utilize some of our student support services for that, perhaps, if we aren't fully engaging them. And student support services aren't just for remedial students. They're for every student. Because I can't argue that anybody's perfect at writing. I think we all need help with writing. Student course surveys. Authentic assessments, there's the real world. Bringing the real world into the classroom and then that exchange. Alignment and peer review. Yes, I went to a session on peer review. Very interested in that because that can be a feedback process to start these conversations. Thank you for responding. And to wrap up, because our time is almost over. In the white papers, what I tried to do was create definitions that we could actually take into our institutions and leverage. Now they are very broad and general because they need to be brought down to the institution level and to the discipline specific area. But we are trying to disentangle what teachers can reasonably do in a classroom and then what students have to shoulder in that classroom and what they should be doing. Um, grounding research, grounding this conversation in research reduces some of those personal attacks and subjective biases. And I think importantly, it gives teachers an opportunity to really demonstrate what they're doing to make teaching visible. It's not just that 20 minute faculty observation. There's a lot more behind the scenes work that goes into it and this will help us see it. And an outcome of that is that we can improve the research that we have to further bolster the techniques that we can deploy in the classroom. So as we close, I will challenge you to take those white papers and make them better. It's a start, it's a research-based framework to go out there and try to implement it, but I wanna see this taken through the scientific process where you try to go out, you find the limits, you break the tool, but then you revise it and make it better and then come present it and share it with the rest of us so that we can all learn and grow from it. Thank you. You're welcome. The reference list is at the end here. There's also a reference list at the back side of the white papers. And if you want to continue the conversation, I have some business cards and there's my email address. So email me. Yes. <laughs>